So let's start off by talking about the trauma pearls from the recent medical literature. The, the basic roadmap of this talk is going to be, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, CT heads. And in anticoagulated patients, do we need to repeat that CT head? That'll be the first question that we ask. Then we're going to move on into some topics related to coagulopathy and trauma and whether certain blood products um, should or shouldn't be given in, in trauma patients, whether um, we can get better improved outcomes. We're going to talk about viscoelastic testing in trauma. This is an up-and-coming diagnostic modality. We're going to talk about pain control in trauma. And finally, we're going to talk about um, COVID and the impact that it had in, in some of our trauma patients. So uh, let's start with the first uh, big question, which is, is a second CT head helpful for the assessment of anticoagulated patients? Meaning a patient, say, is on Coumadin, is on aspirin, is on uh, any Plavix, etc. They come in, you get a CT head, the CT head is negative. Do we then need to pursue a second CT at any point during their ED stay? Do they need to be observed? All those things. Short answer, we do not need to get a second CT head on these patients. So let's talk about some of the literature on this. We've reviewed this topic in the past in prior EMMA courses, but this, this first uh, abstract, abstract number one, is very interesting. Uh, repeat head computed tomography for anticoagulated patients with an initial negative scan is not cost effective. This was a study that was done out of UC San Diego. And the reason that they were able to publish this study was actually because their protocol was for all anticoagulated patients to get an initial head CT and then repeat the head CT. So they were able to go back and collect all their data um, uh, with this using their old protocols. And their conclusion ultimately was like, ah, maybe we didn't need to do this all those years. And also it was really expensive. Those are the big takeaways. So this was a UCSD trauma registry from 2014 to 2019. They enrolled about 1,700 blunt head trauma patients. All of them got two CTs six hours apart, assuming that the first CT was negative. Um, they definitely got a second CT, but if it was positive, a lot of times these patients do get repeat CT. So let me be clear. If somebody has blood on their initial CT and they're anticoagulated, it's generally a good idea to get that second CT. If the initial CT is negative, the question is whether the second CT is negative and the answer is gonna be no. So uh, about 1,400 of those patients, 82% of them had an initial head CT that was negative. In the ones that got the second, all the ones that got the second head CT, there was only 12 out of those 1,400 patients that had positive second scans. That's 0.9%, about 1% of all patients that got repeat CTs actually had a positive scan. So why are we saying it doesn't matter? The reason we're saying that is, of all of those patients, there was no neurosurgical intervention there was no increase in uh, ICPs, intracranial pressures, and there was no change in neuro status or mental status in any of these patients. To piggyback off the findings of this study, it's also known that sometimes that delayed bleed occurs not in that six hour OBS period, but can happen in a delayed fashion. So even if you get the CT and it's negative at six hours, it doesn't mean that they might not have a positive scan in four or five days. But again, most of the studies show that those repeat scans do not, uh, correlate with clinically important outcomes, okay? So they also looked at cost analysis and they found that there was $1 million uh, of extra cost in doing these additional head CT scans that could have been avoided. That's not including the extra time that was used for observation and that kind of thing. So let me just wrap this up into a clinical sort of way. If you have somebody who's on anticoagulation, they get an initial negative head CT um, and they are pretty reliable and have good follow-up and all those things. That patient generally, if they have no other thing going on, um, can, based on the best current evidence, uh, be discharged, okay? Assuming they have good follow-up and all that kind of stuff. If I give you an example of somebody who is anticoagulated, they have an initial negative head CT scan, um, but you're walking them and they're sort of unstable and they're a fall risk and they live alone and they're continuing to be anticoagulated, that's a patient I might take a different approach on because maybe the reason that they came into your ED was because they live alone and they're unsteady gait or they're drinking and all that kind of stuff. So you just gotta take these case by case, but on mass, the general recommendation is you don't need to get a delayed uh, second scan on, on uh, people with good follow-up. The second study, we don't need to go into great detail. It's another single, um, study, single center study from Michigan that looks at the incidence of traumatic delayed intracranial hemorrhage among patients using direct oral anticoagulants. We have 
a lot of papers looking at Coumadin, Plavix, things like that, single center studies that are very similar to this one. All of them basically show the same thing. The incidence is very low and that the clinically important relevance of like even the positive delayed CTs is, is, um, is usually not clinically relevant. Okay. So uh, we've tackled the head CT question. Let's move on to the next big question. And this is a big topic. So we're going to spend a little bit more time here. The question is, what is the latest on fluid and blood product resuscitation and trauma? So let's talk a little bit about the concept first, and then we'll break, uh, break down the studies. What most of these uh, studies are going to be looking at is this concept of coagulopathy and trauma. There's a concept called trauma-induced coagulopathy, TIC. And what it is is somebody who sustained a severe trauma, they're at risk from decompensating from their injuries. They're also at risk for decompensating because of this coagulopathy that tends to develop in a significant subset of severely injured trauma patients. And so you develop this sort of cycle of coagulopathy. It's, it's the reason that we warm patients, because keeping them cold can then make them more coagulopathic. It's also the reason that there's a lot in a lot of the trauma literature where we avoid giving too much crystalloid fluids because it starts to dilute their coagulation factors and instead of giving blood, and then they can uh, have higher risk of developing coagulopathy. Those are some of the reasons. Um, and so we're going to talk a lot about the different sort of fluid types and what type of blood to give and all that kind of stuff. We're also going to talk about hypertonic saline in head injured patients. How many of you are given hypertonic saline for your severe brain injuries right now? Not too many. Okay. So it, it used to be that for severe head injured patients, we would either give mannitol or hypertonic. But let's talk about hypertonic first. That'll be the first fluid um, that, we, that we dive into. So abstract number three is the COBE study. Uh, this, it's called the effect of continuous infusion of hypertonic saline versus standard care on six-month neurologic outcomes in patients with traumatic brain injury, the COBE randomized control trial. And so a little background on this. There was some either no evidence or weak evidence that hypertonic saline would be able to help decrease the brain edema in somebody who's had significant trauma to their brain with a head bleed and that kind of thing. And the idea in giving hypertonic saline or mannitol was to help reduce that, um, that edema to prevent their ICPs from going up. But in, in study, we give it very frequently in our ED. If we have somebody that is coming in with like a GCS of three, four, and they've had bad brain injury and they're on their way to CT, a lot of times we'll just hang the hypertonic saline um, on the way to CAT scan or if they've been known to have bleeding. But the question is, where is the evidence on this? And this is one of the first big randomized control trials looking at this question. This was a two and a half year French multi-center RCT in nine ICUs. They enrolled 370 patients with traumatic brain injury and a GCS less than 13. So real, like real kind of significant TBIs and an abnormal CT head with brain bleed. And they randomized the patients into getting 20% hypertonic saline drips versus getting a control. And then they looked at favorable neurologic outcome as their primary outcome at six months. What they found, unfortunately, was that there was not a whole lot of benefit. No change in neuro outcomes, no change in intracranial hemorrhage or six-month mortality. Really, none of the major outcomes, primary or secondary, that they looked at really had any, any, uh, anything in there. In terms of the guidelines, the American Association of, Association of Neurosurgeons 2016, I'm just going to read them to you. They have a severe traumatic brain injury guideline. This is what their guidelines say. While there is an increased use of hypertonic saline as a hyperosmotic agent, there is insufficient evidence available from comparative studies to support a formal recommendation. It continues to be recommended in a lot of the trauma west, east, west and east. If you're ever looking for really like sort of the big trauma guidelines, there's the west group and there is the east group, the west side and the east side of trauma. And they are sort of like the preemptive voices in trauma care. And um, we continue to advocate for hypertonic saline. And, uh, you know, in traumatic brain injury patients, what I would advocate for is making sure that we're getting them to the OR right away, that they're getting decompressed at a timely way. And if they're anticoagulated, that we're reversing their anticoagulation to the best of our ability. Hypertonic saline, although theoretically has a good uh, rationale for its use, it hasn't borne out in the studies yet. And I'll tell you, in a lot of the level one trauma centers, they're still using it. Um, it's just good to know what the evidence in the literature behind it is. Okay? I wouldn't prioritize it over other life-saving interventions. Next up, uh, abstracts number four 
abstract number five and abstract number six and abstract number seven. The next four abstracts, we're going to talk about uh, blood component therapy in the setting of a severely injured trauma patient. What is blood component therapy? What, why does it matter? So if you get somebody coming in with a stab wound to the abdomen or um, a bad multi-system blunt trauma, and they've lost a lot of blood, their hemoglobin is seven, they're hypotensive, we're giving blood back, right? The question is, in what form are we gonna give that blood back that is the best possible, that will re result in the best possible outcome for the patient? Traditionally, we've been giving packed red blood cells, PRBCs. Right? That's what a lot of places have, the packed red blood cells. Um, if you're lucky, you end up having the O negative or, or the O positive ready to go, and you don't even have to type and cross match or any of that. Um, but if you don't have that, oftentimes we have to type and screen and, and do all that. But the question is, should we be giving just PRBCs? Should we be giving PRBCs and plasma? Should we be giving PRBCs, plasma, and platelets? Or should we just be giving whole blood altogether because it's the most natural way to replenish things? And so why do we care? Again, this goes back to the rationale of coagulopathy and trauma. If we're giving just PRBCs, PRBCs, if I give someone 10 units of packed red blood cells, what am I not giving them? Yeah, I'm not giving them their coagulation factors. And we just talked about how coagulopathy and trauma is such a big deal. And so the rationale for a lot of these studies looking at, well, why sh we should be giving plasma, we should be giving platelets on top of that, is to make sure that every time we're giving them a unit of PRBCs, we're also giving them what naturally exists in their body, which is the ability to clot so that they don't develop these like coagulopathic uh, states and trauma. So that's the rationale. So let's go into the studies and see what the studies show. Abstract number four is a, th this is actually looking at uh, giving blood products, component blood therapy in, in uh, patients with traumatic brain injury. But let me, I'll give you the big trial and I'll give you the, the secondary analysis. It is, this trial is called the Association of Pre-Hospital Plasma with Survival in Patients with Traumatic Brain Injury. This is actually a secondary analysis of the bigger trial, if you're interested in this topic. The bigger trial is called the PAMPER trial. And the PAMPER trial was an aeromedical uh, sort of military study on, uh, on uh, excuse me, an aeromedical air transport study on traumatically injured patients. So the bigger PAMPER trial looked at the effect of giving blood and plasma to patients with really bad traumatic injuries, all of them. This study is a secondary analysis looking at just those patients that also had traumatic brain injury, okay? So let me give you the results of the PAMPER trial in general, and then we'll talk about this one. The PAMPER trial in general demonstrated a significant mortality benefit in patients that received plasma along with their packed red blood cells versus just getting packed red blood cells. They found 23% mortality in the plasma group versus 33% mortality in the just packed red blood cell group. So can we extrapolate that data into traumatic brain injuries? And so this was a secondary analysis. They had about 500 patients enrolled in the bigger PAMPER trial. With, and all of these patients had low blood pressure and or tachycardia and were hypotensive, sick or trauma patients. They found a subset, about 166, that also had traumatic brain injury. They either randomized them getting plasma or no plasma. And they looked at 30-day mortality in these patients. And it turned out that in the secondary subgroup analysis, that the 30-day mortality was lower in the plasma group with a um, uh, hazard ratio of 0.55. So they were less likely to have 30-day mortality compared to their counterparts. Now, an important thing to understand about these secondary or these subgroup analyses when they do this is that this wasn't the primary aim of the study. The primary aim was to look at the, in, the trauma patient that was injured like whole body. When you get a secondary analysis like this or subgroup analysis, it means that you, you can't like definitively apply that clinically. That is a hypothesis generating thing. And so this needs to be taken out and it is fodder for further study, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're saying when you give plasma and packed red blood cells together, it's gonna improve the outcomes for all head injured patients. However, the broader study did show that the mortality was lower when you gave plasma and packed red blood cells to uh, traumatically injured uh, patients that were hypotensive tachycardic. So that's one study. The next uh, paper, abstract number five, we just talked about the PAMPER study, that's their aeromedical transport. This abstract is looking at both that study, 
and also another study called the COMBAT trial, which was an EMS transport study. And they analyzed both of those, and they looked to see what the 28-day mortality was for traumatically injured patients who were hypotensive and tachycardic. So the study is basically taking the results of two trials and trying to see, well, giving plasma or no plasma in these patients, did it help? And what they found was there was lower mortality in the patient that patients that also got plasma therapy in addition to their packed red blood cells. The mortality difference was 21%, 28-day mortality, in the plasma group versus 29% in the no plasma group. So again, we're seeing over and over again that this component therapy, that adding plasma could possibly be helpful. The, the, the big study, if you, if you go back in time, I think it was about 2015, the proper trial, P-R-O-P-P-R -P -P trial, looked at giving what type of ratios do we need to give. It was a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one versus a one-to-one-to-two ratio. And what the, the one versus the two is, is how much uh, platelets and plasma do we need to give for every single uh, unit of packed red blood cells that we give? So for every one unit of packed red blood cells, should we be giving one unit of platelets and one unit of plasma? Or for every two units of packed red blood cells, should we be giving one unit of plasma and one unit of platelets? And what they found in that study was there was no mortality difference at 30 days, but they did find that the deaths from exsanguination, which was not their primary outcome, um, actually resulted in a lower, a lower death from ex exsanguination in the group that got one to one to one. So if you're at a major trauma center, and if you're not at a major trauma center, and you're looking at component therapy, like I'm giving multiple units of packed red blood cells, try to match each of those packed red blood cells with a unit of plasma and a unit of um, platelets. That's sort of like the best practice as we, uh, as we are in, in 2021, 2022. Okay. Let's move on to um, abstract number six. So you've been noticing that we've been talking a lot about plasma pl plus plaque red blood cells, but we haven't been really looking at too many papers on like platelets. Why not? And so abstract number six actually explores that question. Platelet to red blood cell ratio and mortality in bleeding trauma patients, a systematic review and meta-analysis. And you can see from their findings, they looked from, at papers spanning from 1946 to 2020. And during that huge time frame, they found five RCTs looking at this uh, that, that would help us answer this question. So the reason we haven't been commenting so much on the platelet component of this is just there's not that much data out there. Um, and so they looked here at bleeding trauma patients who were getting platelets. They used the primary outcome of 30-day mortality. And they looked at patients who got a higher platelet to blood uh, uh, ratio versus patients that got a higher plasma to blood ratio. And they found that the higher platelet to blood ratio resulted in a lower 30-day mortality when compared to the plasma with an odds ratio of 0 0.8. This isn't great, great data because it's a compilation of not, not great data. But in mass, like now we're looking sort of in aggregate of all the studies that we have. Again, this just kind of reinforces our current practice. Packed red blood cells should be combined with component therapy, platelets and plasma, um, to avoid this coagulation, uh, coagulopathy and trauma. Okay, so the last abstract, abstract number seven, is saying, well, why are we even messing around with like giving a PRBC and then having to go like find the, the, um, the thawed uh, FFP and then finding platelets and then giving it all in three separate components? Why not just give whole blood? And the military is doing this. It's just uh, logistically a lot easier to carry whole blood than to like try to give component therapy. But if we're so worried about this coagulopathy, why not just give it in the whole blood form? That would be the simplest way. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of data on this, but this, this abstract number seven is a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at whole blood transfusion versus component therapy and trauma resuscitation. They looked at 12 different studies one of which was an RCT, so again, not great data. One out of the 12 studies was an RCT, one was a prospective observational, and then we had 10 chart reviews. So not going off great data, but they were able to identify about 8,000 patients, and in those 8,000 patients, there was no um, evidence of uh, change in 24-hour mortality, no change in 30-day mortality. So we do need more practice, more, more data in here. I'm hoping we get more data from the military and we'll probably get some more data on this in some form from the trauma centers. But again, uh, the current practice supports, based on the evidence, the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one and not yet whole blood. All right, that's a lot of uh, blood, blood talk in, in trauma.
So let's shift to abstract number eight, um, which we're going to uh, shift away from talking about blood for a moment, and we're going to talk about IV fluids. A lot of places don't have blood in the, in the sort of capacity that a lot of these trauma centers have. So it's a lot easier to give normal saline. And in the trauma literature, the recommendation has moved from, um, hey, if you're going to give like an IV fluid bolus, limit your IV fluids and move, uh, move to blood, especially in patients that you know have lost blood because of the coagulopathy problem that we talked about. Abstract number eight is a, um, exploring this question of do, how, should we be giving IV fluids for traumatically injured pediatric patients? And this is the East Peds trauma sort of recommendations. The abstract uh, is called Timing and Volume of Crystalloid and Blood Products in Pediatric Trauma, an Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma Multicenter Prospective Observational Study. This is the East uh, Trauma Consortium that we were talking about, where if you ever like, want to know what the guidelines say, just pop in East Guidelines for, I don't know, uh, blunt cervical injury or whatever it is. So this is the East group. They did, they looked at 24 pediatric trauma centers, an observational study. They enrolled 712 patients. And they looked at a primary, and all of these patients were, uh, had significantly, uh, you know, significant injuries and they were getting, uh, getting IV fluids. The primary outcome was mortality and, and uh, increases in ICU ventilator or hospital days. And they looked at patients who were getting IV fluids versus patients that got less IV fluids. And what they found was in patients that got more IV fluids, those patients also had poorer outcomes. They, they found that they were, there was an increase in ventilator days associated, ICU days and length of stay days associated with the, the pediatric patients that got more IV fluids. Now, what's the problem with that rationale? We don't know if it's the chicken or the egg. Were the patients getting more IV fluids because they were really, really sick and hypotensive, so we gave them more and more IV fluids? In which case, you would expect that they would have worse outcomes, ICU days, vent days, and whatnot. Or was it because we gave them the IV fluids that became more sick? It's impossible to tell from these observational studies. You would need to do an RCT. Nonetheless, the um, East group did recommend, based off the findings of this study, that, uh, that we should not be giving uh, IV fluid crystalloids. Here's their conclusion. Resuscitation with greater than one crystalloid bolus was associated with increased need for transfusion and worse outcomes, including extended duration of mechanical ventilation hospitalization. These data support a crystalloid sparing early transfusion approach for resuscitation of injured children. Now, do I agree with the rationale for it? Yes, I agree with the rationale. It's the same rationale that we're applying to adults. However, this type of study does not give you that kind of information. But that's where we're at right now. The general recommendation in trauma patients is to limit IV fluid tr um, transfusion and to quickly move to blood when you know that they're um, losing blood in some, some capacity. Okay, question number three. Are viscoelastic tests better than traditional coagulation tests in trauma? What are the traditional coagulation tests? Well, those are our you know, platelet counts, our PTs, our INRs, the things that we're typically getting on our blood test. What in the world is a viscoelastic test? How many of you have these at your institution? One. We have a total of one person, two, two people that have these uh, viscoelastic tests available. We have them. Um, they sound like wonderful tools. I'm going to describe what they are, and then we're going to talk about the literature behind them. But they're these sort of little bedside point of care test. It's a little analyzer. You drop blood in there, and it has, it has to be calibrated. And it basically, in real time, the, it spits out sort of a little like graph for you in there. And it's supposed to tell you which patients are those patients that we're worried about that are coagulopathic and trauma. Pretty cool, right? If we could tell in real time, like there's about one out of every four badly, trauma, uh, badly injured trauma patient ends up having this coagulopathy problem. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could figure out who that one out of four person was and then tailor our treatment to it? And so in 2016, there was a Cochrane review that looked at this, and based off mostly just observational data, they, they, uh, they concluded that these viscoelastic tests in trauma, if we can use them appropriately, may actually decrease mortality in trauma patients and could decrease the need for blood products. Because now we're not just willy-nilly giving all these component therapies, we can actually really tailor our approach to these patients, and wouldn't that be cool? but it hasn't really been studied in big RCTs until now. And so let's talk about the two studies that looked at these viscoelastic assays. 
Abstract number nine, um, site of care viscoelastic assay in major trauma improves outcomes and is cost neutral compared to standard coagulation tests. This was a positive study. This was a UK single center observational perspective trial, a before and after. So they enrolled 300 major trauma patients and they kind of like looked at the outcomes before they started using these viscoelastic tests. You'll hear them, uh, there's two different major types, TEG and ROTEM. Which one are you guys using at your shop? Don't know. ROTEM, yeah. So depending on your institution, they might have TEG, they might have ROTEM. Um, and it takes experience to be able to read these things. And then they, they, so they kind of had 126 patients before and then 175 patients after using TEG as their viscoelastic assay. And they looked at the primary outcome of mortality and transfusions. What they found was the mortality before the application of these assays was 25% in these really like high sort of inju injury severity score patients, but it was only 11% after they started to apply these. So it looks pretty good on first pass. On face, this looks like, hey, these viscoelastic assays might be really helpful. When you deep dive a little bit more and you look at the characteristics of the patients before and after, unfortunately, the pre-group, the group that had higher mortality, also had a higher inju injury severity score, also, um, they were older patients in general and had higher lactate. So they were at baseline sicker. So it's really hard to tell. Was it the viscoelastic assay that helped bring down the mortality? Or was it just the fact that they were sicker patients in the pre and then less sick patients in the post? Which leads us to abstract number, it should be abstract number 10, um, the ITACTIC trial. Um, you can see sort of the bullet points there, but I think the actual trial is in the addendum. This is the biggest, most well-designed trial looking at this, at the use of these viscoelastic assays to date. This was done in um, the Nordic countries. It was an RCT done at seven trauma centers. They enrolled about 400 patients. They randomized them to getting viscoelastic assays versus getting uh, traditional conventional uh, coagulation tests. And they looked at, uh, as a primary outcome, patients that were alive and free of massive transfusions 24-hour post-injury and they found no difference. They didn't find any difference between this, this viscoelastic group and the non-viscoelastic group. So now, um, this, despite this uh, assay being very promising and a lot of folks like really wanting this thing to be, you know, shown to be beneficial, we don't know what patients, maybe all of these patients that they enrolled, we haven't found the right patient population. So there's probably gonna be more, more study on this. And so to give you an idea of what kind of patients that they enrolled, less than 30% in each group got massive transfusions in this study. So those are probably the patients that we wanna study the most. There, I hope that one day we can find patients that are getting massive transfusion protocols, applying this viscoelastic assay and seeing if it works in those patients. One of the big areas that might be helpful, like I know a lot of trauma centers, they're even looking at, hey, should we give more TXA? So the, the idea behind TXA, we talked about in the CRASH-2 trial, the idea behind giving TXA in trauma patients is that there's a condition called hyperfibrinolysis. And when these trauma patients get into this hyper, hyperfibrinolytic cascade, the idea is that TXA can help break that cascade. And, and maybe that's the reason why when we give TXA early for bad traumas, we're not identifying only the patients that have hyperfibrinolysis, but we're giving them to all trauma patients. So the idea would be that maybe, like, if we could identify based off these little assays which patients have hyperfibrinolysis, which it can do, then maybe those patients would benefit. So I think we're going to see more and more study on this. I hope that the, there's some benefit for this because it's point of care, it's dynamic, they could use it in the trauma ICUs, it would be a great tool, but to date, um, the evidence hasn't been, hasn't borne out in the big, the biggest single RCT on the topic. Um, so I, I guarantee there will be more to come on this, on this topic. Next big section is what's new in pain management for trauma patients. I'm not going to dive too deep into abstracts number 10, 11, and 12, but I'll give you a broad overview. All of those, all of these abstracts, 10, 11, and 12, are looking at a uh, medication called methoxyfluorine. And they're comparing it to, you know, in tra traumatized patients, they're looking at uh, a methoxyfluorine, sort of like patient self-administered versus uh, Motrin or uh, uh, ibupro or Motrin or uh, Tylenol or morphine or all these kinds of things. The problem, the reason I'm not going to deep dive into this is the FDA, as of 1999, has pulled this drug from um, from the U.S. It's not even available to us. Um, but 
I'll tell you all of the studies that are being done out of Australia, the UK, Spain, it Italy, um, they're all pretty promising for, for these patients. And it kind of gives the patients a little bit of control. So what these studies are showing is that methoxyfluorine performs better than some of the traditional pain meds that we're giving. But unfortunately, we don't have it. Why don't we have it? Um, Abbott Laboratories pulled it, I think, circa 1999. The reason that they pulled it was that it was associated with nephrotoxicity. The problem is it hasn't been shown to be nephrotoxic in patients that are getting it in intermittent sort of inhalations. And, they, and, and in these studies, that's how they were using it. Or in like under 30 minutes of use, it hasn't really been shown to be problematic. Uh, so they're using it in Eastern Europe, they're using it in New Zealand, they're using it in a lot of countries where we don't have it, but it's something to keep an eye out on if it does come back to the States. Abstract number 12, oh no, sorry, abstract number 13. Uh, for all you ultrasound junkies out there, this was, uh, I know we were doing a similar study like this uh, in our shop, intercostal liposomal bupivacaine injection for rib fractures, a prospective randomized control trial. So the scenario is you get a patient who's coming in, bad car accident, they have multiple rib fractures, um, and they're in a lot of pain. And the question is whether, like if we could just inject the patients over the ribs and get some of those intercostal blocks, can we give these patients uh, you know, pain improvement? This was a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized controlled trial that was uh, looking at ICU patients, and they enrolled 100 patients that had pretty bad chest trauma. These were patients, obviously, who made it to the ICU, so their trauma must have been significant. They also had less than 50% inspiratory capacity. And so part of the rationale for getting these patients' pain under control is so that they can use that uh, inspirative, ins it, the IS, ins incentive spirometer, excuse me. Um, so they take that incentive spirometer and that they were able to take big, big breaths in. So that's why they were studying this to see, like, could we get their pain under control for them to be able to do this? Unfortunately, the pain scores and breakthrough pain meds at 96 hours didn't pan out. However, you know, these, this is a pretty sick, uh, sick patient population. I wonder, and we wonder, and I know it's being studied currently, patients that have one or two rib fractures, man, that's pretty painful in and of itself. And can we help those patients by doing uh, intercostal blocks? And that's being studied as we speak. My wife, I'll tell you a quick story. We went, after we had our first boy, he was three months old, and we decided, we're like, you know what, let me, let's, um, Put our, get, get our three-month-old with uh, the grandparents and let's go skiing or snowboarding and um, let's get to the mountains. And so we did that. We went off and we went, uh, we went on our first ski trip. And my wife got off the first ski lift and she was just like, oh my God, I, like, none of my core muscles exist anymore after the pregnancy. And she started to fall. And it was a pretty icy trip down the mountain. And by the time we got halfway down the mountain, she had broken two ribs. Um, and uh, had a commutative dist distal radius fracture. And the medics came up and they, you know, they put her in the little like gurney and took her down. And she was such a trooper. And that night she had her, she was casted like this. Um, and I was like, okay, well, so we should cut this tr trip short. And she was like, we're going to dinner. I need a drink. And so the whole dinner, she's sitting with her, this rib fractures with her arm like this, um, having a drink in this hand, and the whole time we kept having the waiters come up, ma'am, can I help you? Because she had a jacket over it. Can I help you? She's like, no, I'm fine. <laughs> I got um, but the poor girl was, you know, she was breastfeeding with rib fractures and whatnot, and we couldn't get her pain under control. And um, I thought about it at that time. I'm like, gosh, I wonder if I could just inject her ribs, like if, how helpful that would be. We'll see. More, uh, more evidence to come on that topic. Uh, last two abstracts. Ready? Abstract number 14 and abstract number 15, we're on the last uh, clinical question, which is, are there important trauma trends to know about in the time of COVID? Yes, the answer is going to be yes, there were important trauma trends. Mo both of these studies are just sad studies. Abstract number 14 and abstract number 15, both have to do with non-accidental trauma. Um, both have to do with sort of when the child care facilities were closing, like how that impacted uh, the rates of non-accidental trauma, and they're not great. Uh, abstract number 14 was done by a British radiology group. They looked at that period, time period, March, April, March to April 2020, a one-month time period. They had 10 cases of um, abusive head trauma during that time, which was a 1,500% increase compared to prior similar time periods. And then uh, abstract number 15 was a Johns Hopkins study that was a chart review looking at child abuse cases in the single month after all the childcare facilities shut down during COVID. Uh, 
And this, this showed that they had eight cases, which was 13% of all of their traumas during that time. Um, that was more than double the prior uh, past couple of years. And so, uh, you know, the pandemic was, was painful on so many levels, but even those sort of unseen levels where like what was going on at home, it, it really had a tremendous impact in terms of trauma and everything else. So um, that is the end of the uh, trauma talk.